So next, I'd like to take a look at uh, acid rain and acid deposition and the causes and the consequences of this issue. So here's a map of the United States showing the pH levels of rain across different parts of the country. So remember, a neutral pH is 7. And then the lower the pH, the more acidic it is. And here in these orange and reddish areas are the lowest pH. So these, this parts of the country, the northeast especially, is where you get the most acidic rain. And the reason for that is this is where the most industry is. Now this map is from 1999 and I expect the situation has improved since then and I'll show you some of the improvement. So first let's take a look at how acid rain forms. So when sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides are emitted from industry and from car exhaust, um, they react with the atmosphere with water vapor to form nitric acid and sulfuric acid. And these acids can then fall down to the ground with rain in the form of acid rain. Acid deposition is when the solid particles of ni nitrogen oxide and sulfur dioxide fall to the ground and when they combine with water, then they form acidic water, um, also sulfuric acid and nitric acid. So acid deposition is just solid particles, acid rain is the um, nitrogen, nitric acid and sulfuric acid falling in the form of rain. Now the main contributor contributors to acid rain are shown here. Um, for sulfur dioxide, utilities contribute the most. So burning coal is actually the biggest contributor to sulfur dioxide. When we burn coal for making electricity, then we emit sulfur dioxide. Nitrogen oxides are also emitted from coal, but the biggest source of nitrogen oxide is transport. So transport, car exhaust, is the number one source of nitrogen oxides. And then utilities, so burning coal, is the second biggest contributor. Now let's take a look at the consequences of acid rain. Now, neutral water, pure water, has a pH of 7. Now, clean rain, even when it's not considered acid rain, is already slightly acidic. So clean rain is 5.6, and here you can see a healthy lake is pH 6.5. When you get acid rain, the rain becomes in a range of more around 4, a pH of 4, and the lakes can also be around 4 or 4.5. And this can affect aquatic life. So you can see trout begin to die at pH 6, frog eggs, crayfish, mayflies, they die around 5.5. When you get to 4.2, all the fish and other aquatic organisms will die. And here's other consequences. Um, this is a picture of the Yzerska Mountains which in the Czech Republic, where you can see all the trees died of acid rain. And this, I'm actually from the Czech Republic originally, and I remember seeing this in my childhood. And it was very sad. This is because under communism, there was a big industrialization, but without proper air pollution controls, forming more acid rain. And other parts of Europe have also had this problem. And so other consequences can be that buildings and cars can get damaged, such as this gargoyle statue in Germany. So let's summarize the main environmental consequences of acid rain. Aquatic organisms die. The acid rain damages plant leaves and the protective cuticle on the leaves, makes the plants more susceptible to diseases, they can't do photosynthesis as well, and they can die. Nutrients also get leached from topsoil. So when soil is acidic, it cannot hold nutrients as well. So they get leached away, again affecting plant life. And also when soil gets acidic, toxic metal ions can get released from rocks, which can make it their way into water supplies, kill the aquatic organisms. And well, when we drink the water, our health can be affected as well. Now our air quality has fortunately improved significantly in the last several decades. Here's a map of the United States showing sulfur dioxide deposition. So in the years 89 through 91, you can see in orange and red where there was the most sulfur dioxide being deposited. And then in 1999 to 2001, you can see that the air quality has already improved. And since then it has improved even further. Here's another piece of data from the EPA showing how um, in blue, so there's a number of lines here, but let's focus on the blue. This is how much the population of the United States has grown by 50% since 1970. The vehicle miles traveled in orange has increased by 168%. And yet at the same time as we've increased the number of cars on the road 
and the number of people driving different cars. The air quality has improved. So the green line shows the emissions of the six most common air pollutants together. So the combined emissions has decreased by 63% since 1970. Now, a large part of this is thanks to the Clean Air Act. The Clean Air Act was established in 1970, and it established what are called the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. And these air quality standards set limits on emissions of the most common air pollutants. So the EPA has the power to limit how much of different air pollutants is released into the air. And then in 1990, there was an amendment which introduced emissions trading for sulfur dioxide. The way emissions trading works is so you have a limit on how much maximum can be emitted. And if, say, a certain factory is emitting less than the maximum, then they can sell their right to pollute to another factory that might want to emit more than that. Now, environmentalists debate as to whether we should or should not have this emissions trading. But in either case, the Clean Air Act as a whole has contributed to significant cleanup of our air. So next, I wanted to go through three different ways in which we can reduce our air pollution. A catalytic, a catalytic converter reduces the emissions from car exhaust. And here's a picture of a catalytic converter under a car. It converts the carbon monoxide and nitrogen oxide emissions into non-toxic molecules. And if you have an older car, you want to make sure to check that it's working properly. A wet scrubber can be installed in a factory. So here it shows dirty air going in, and then inside the wet scrubber, the air pollutants are sprayed with mists of water vapor, and the water vapor traps particulates and sulfur dioxide. They get mixed with crushed limestone and converted into a sludge that can be disposed of in a landfill, and then out comes the clean air. An electrostatic precipitator um, does a similar thing, just differently. Here's dirty air coming in, and then here, the high voltage is applied to the gas particles to make them charged. And then electrodes on either side can attract the charged particles, collect them, and then dispose of them in a landfill, and out comes the clean air. So our air pollution has been greatly reduced, but unfortunately not completely eliminated. Here's some data from the EPA showing parts of the country where um, at least some of the main air pollutants that the EPA measures for have, are above the allowable levels. In yellow are the worst areas that have at least three of the main air pollutants above the allowable limits. In blue is have two, and green is where there's just one air pollutant above the allowable limits. So it is an issue that we still need to pay attention to and continue improving. So the last issue I'd like to take a look at is indoor air pollution. Just think about how much time you spend indoors. It's probably significantly more than outdoors. So we need to take a look at what health hazards we have inside. And I'll come back to this slide that summarizes different air pollutants. I'll first want to go through some of the more important ones one by one. In developing countries, the biggest source of indoor air pollution is burning fuel. Whether it is wood, grass clippings, or coal, they can release particulates, carbon monoxide, and sulfur dioxide. So burning fuel indoors is one of the biggest uh, contributors to air pollution and to causing health problems and shortening lifespan. Now let's take a look at the developed world. Um, one common air pollutant we have is radon. So radon is a radioactive gas that's formed from the decay of uranium, and it's naturally present in certain rocks and soil. So there's no way we can get it out. It is naturally present, and the EPA here has a map of which parts of the country have the most radon. So in red, the zone one is where there is the most radon. If you live in one of these um, zones, it is recommended that you get your house checked for radon to see whether there's any seeping in through uh, cracks in the foundation. Um, because it is a radioactive gas, it can be a carcinogen. It can cause cancer. Another indoor air pollutant is asbestos. This is a fibrous mineral, and here you can see a picture of it. And this used to be commonly used in insulation, um, drywall, roofing, flooring, etc. Um, it is no longer used because it was found that it causes lung damage and is a type of cancer known as mesothelioma. Now, even though it is no longer used in a new building material, 
If you live in an older building, it can still be present. So in older buildings, whenever they change the roofing or the siding, they have to take a look at whether there's asbestos present. Formaldehyde is a pollutant more commonly found in new homes. It is found in carpets and wood paneling cabinets, and it is formaldehyde is a VOC, a volatile organic compound, and it is a carcinogen. It can cause cancer. Now, I'm not a big fan of wall-to-wall -wall carpeting for these reasons that I'm going to show you. So besides formaldehyde, there's also styrene, which is a VOC, and other VOCs present in carpets. It's particularly problem in new carpets. So that new carpet smell, this is these VOCs, and styrene can also be a carcinogen, though it's not as well known whether it is. And older carpets, all of this can accumulate. So dust mites, which are these little organisms that can live in carpets, they can contribute to allergies. Mold can also grow in carpets, also contributes to allergies. Bacteria and pesticide residues can be carried in on shoes, and they have found when they've done studies, there's quite a lot of bacteria found on the soles of your shoes. So in some countries, it is customary to remove your shoes when you enter the house, and it's for a good reason. All right, so here's a summary of indoor air pollutants. So we have various chemicals such as formaldehyde uh, released by furnishing materials. There's mold and bacteria that can grow in carpets and on walls and cause um, allergies and other health problems. Chemicals coming from cleaning products such as dry cleaning, carbon monoxide coming from car exhaust. Um, if you smoke, or cigarette smoke is a huge contributor to indoor air pollution. It has 4,000 chemicals, many of them being carcinogens and mutagens. Radon can seep in through uh, cracks in the foundation. Chemical fumes, various VOCs, are present in paint and solvents. Um, animal dander and hair can cause allergies. Um, carbon monoxide from fireplaces. There's all sorts of air pollutants. And there's things you can do to reduce air pollution, such as buying low of VOC paint and low VOC carpets. So they now sell these green paint and green carpets that will have fewer chemicals. All of these indoor air pollutants can cause something called the sick building syndrome. This is an illness with a variety of symptoms caused by indoor air pollution. So it can cause headaches, fatigue, dizziness and nausea, difficulty concentrating, irritation of the skin, eyes, nose and throat. This is particularly in buildings that might not have very good ventilation or be older buildings that might have more mold growing. Um, so more and more uh, workplaces, offices are paying attention to this to make sure that their workers can be healthy and concentrate on work. Now, lastly, I'd just like to tell you what you can do to help improve our air quality. So there's many things that you can probably think of yourself, such as carpool, walk, take public transportation, use a bicycle, um, have your car checked to make sure that the catalytic converter is working properly. You can also conserve electricity by turning off the light when you leave a room, use more efficient light bulbs, not leave the TV on all the time in the background. We can also consume fewer products so we don't have as big a need for manufacturing. And indoors, you can help by not smoking, buying low VOC paint and low VOC carpets, and so on. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. I hope you found it useful, and I'll see you next time.